Christ's name, amen. Who here needs a vacation? Yeah, okay. Me too. Now, I get to go on one tomorrow. Praise God. I'm really excited. But rest is an important thing, and I would know. I like to tell people that I'm not smart. I'm just quicker to screw up than most people, and so I tend to learn the lessons early. Um, I'm 36 now, but I had my midlife crisis at age 20, so I am well ahead of the curve. Um, Around the age of 20, I decided that I was, you know, wise and all-knowing and knew what life should be like. And so I decided to live life um, full throttle to the hilt. It's like, well, if time is money, then the more stuff I can get done in the shortest amount of time, the better off I'm going to be. And so I went for it. I was going to school. I was in college and decided I can do more than most people. So I signed up for 23 credits that semester And then I was working 27 hours a week to pay the bills and tutoring 14 hours a week to pay for my coffee addiction. And because I have no limits, I don't need to sleep a whole lot. And so for that semester, I was getting less than four hours of sleep every night. And I had at least one all-night study session every week for the entire semester. In the words of Bilbo Baggins, I felt like butter scraped across too much bread. And while I'm trying to control everything outside my life. I'm also trying to control everything inside my life. And since I didn't have time to exercise, I decided it would be a wonderful idea to to manage my physical appearance through an eating disorder called bulimia, because I'm a smart guy, but not really. And if you're not familiar with what that is, that is the process whereby you consume all the food you want to, and then you puke it up and waste it, and then you do it again and again. And my life was a mess. And I was worn thin. And I thought I could do everything. And I thought that I could just work myself and not have to ever answer for it. And the truth is, is that I didn't. Like I said, I had a midlife crisis at the age of 20. And God broke me in a really good way. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. This morning, I want to give you guys a little clue so that you don't have to learn the lesson the way I did. The lesson that, contrary to the American economy, time is not money. It's not just something to spend and to invest and to save. That we are more than cogs in a machine and that work, while something important that God has given us to do, is not all there is to life. There's a better way. One that involves rest and freedom and redemption and renewal in God's presence. And that brings us to the book of Leviticus today. See, as we conclude... Jennifer, if you want to go to a full screen, that's not my PowerPoint for this uh, Sunday. Thanks. Uh, Not a problem. Um, As we come to the book of Leviticus, we are concluding this book that good Bible reading plans go to die. Eric, do you want to help uh, Jennifer go to a full screen? Again, I I don't have a PowerPoint this morning, so we can just go to the camera. Um, There we go. Sorry about that. So the book of Leviticus is the turning point in the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy. The the flow, the structure, it begins in the beginning with a good God who creates heaven and earth and wants to bless his human partners. Humanity uh, given to steward and to rule over creation um, underneath the authority of God. And so humanity is invited into a special place, a garden that God has prepared where they can enjoy abundance and life in God's presence with the stipulation that in order to stay here, we actually have to listen to what God says is good for us. And due to the influences of a seedy serpent, the original humanity decided that rather than trusting that God knows what's good for humanity, we're going to go our own way because, hey, that looks pretty good over there. And the world was broken. And the rest of the Bible is a continual story of God's attempt to bless humanity and humanity's continual attempt to rebel against God and not trust what he has to say. Now, Genesis begins with God's renewal project. God didn't give up on humanity. Instead, he chose one person, a guy named Abram, and through Abram's family, which would become the people of Israel, God is endeavoring to bless the world. And so when you arrive at the book of Exodus, Abraham's descendants, the nation of Israel, have become enslaved in Egypt, and they are worked harshly by Pharaoh. They're building cities, 
and they're enslaved, and it's bitter work. Some of you guys might be able to relate to that. And God comes to set them free from slavery in Egypt in order that they might learn what it is to serve God. And God rescues the people out of Egypt. They travel through the wilderness and they go to Mount Sinai where they enter into a binding covenant with God. From here on out, they're going to be God's people. And Yahweh, the I am who I am, will be their God. And there's a lot to say about the personal name of God, Yahweh, or I am who I am. But one thing that we can say is that this God is not like anyone else. Like, can you explain yourself? And God's like, um, not really. Just, just look at me. I'm not going to compare myself to anything you saw in Egypt or anything in the land of Canaan. If you want to look around at the gods that everyone else is worshiping, that's not going to help you a whole lot. Like, I'm me. And if you want to know who I am, get to know me and then learn to live in light of me. And God calls the nation of Israel to be a holy, special people through the nation of Israel's practices and worship, the rest of the world is going to understand who this creator God is after all. And the problem is that God is a source of life, goodness, and blessing. And humanity, well, we bring corruption into God's presence, pollution, and those things don't mix. God is like the sun. He is like Um, the Bonneville Dam and the turbines that provide power for all of the Portland metro area. He is profoundly good, and he's also so powerful that he's dangerous. It doesn't mean that he's bad. It just means that we can't go into God's presence the way that we are. Um, Like the sun, if we in our fallen state try to enter his presence without some sort of protection or preparation, (laughs) we're going to burn. We'll just die. And so God makes a way for his people to enter his presence, and that way is a sacrificial system. The way is through the purity laws of Leviticus. And Leviticus is this rule book that's embedded within a story. And again, it's all about how do we draw close to the God that wants to live with us and meet with us as the ancient Israelites. And there's a lot for us to learn. And so when we come to chapter 23, it starts off with Yahweh speaking to Moses, saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed feasts of Yahweh that you shall proclaim as holy convocations or, or sacred assemblies. They are my appointed feasts. And right off the bat, if we, are the, if we are attentive readers, we realize something. We've heard this terminology before. In the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, on day 4, when God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, he puts them in the sky to be for signs and for, many of our Bibles say seasons, but it's actually for appointed times. Why did God put the sun, moon, and stars up there? The calendar that even to this day my watch is, is measuring the circuit of the stars around the earth. God put the stars in the sky so that we would know when it's time to go meet with God. And so the nation of Israel are given seven festivals to remember who God is and to come and meet with him. The first one is the Sabbath. Every seven days, you're going to take a break. When you worked for Pharaoh, he worked you to the grind. He was like the American economy, like you're always hustling for Pharaoh. But now that God has rescued you, this is what it looks like to work for Yahweh. Every seven days, you stop. That's what the word Sabbath means. It means cease, desist, quit. Don't do any regular work. Later, it became associated with worship of God as well. But the first and primary meaning is you just got to stop it. You have to trust that God is the ruler of everything, and that the world will continue without our constant effort. Every seven days, you take a break. This is something that God has commanded. If you are going to be God's servants now, you start by stopping every seven days. And then the next festival is a Passover, where we remember God's salvation as he rescues the people out of Egypt. You have the Feast of first fruits. And then you have 50 days later, the Feast of Pentecost. And then in the seventh month, there's three festivals, the Day of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Festival of Booths. And I just want to highlight two of those, the Day of Atonement. Now, we, we were there in Leviticus chapter 16, but here we have the regulations not for the priesthood, but for the rest of the assembly. In verse 26, Yahweh speaks to Moses and he says, now on the 10th day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves. It means fast uh, and present a food offering to Yahweh. You shall not do any work on that very day. It is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before Yahweh your God. 
For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. Whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among the people. I mean it. You don't work. You rest while someone else makes atonement for you. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout the generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. And on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. You shall keep your rest. Okay? I don't know if you heard that. Stop. <laughs> like, stop working. Rest, rest, rest. Afflict yourself. Atonement will be made for you. And five days after this uh, particular festival, you have the Feast of Booths. Harvest has come in, and now everyone go out and cut yourself some branches, particularly from trees that live by streams of water, and build yourself a tent. And the whole nation's going to have a camping trip together. You're going to go live in tents outside and celebrate God's goodness for seven days and be reminded of the fact that when God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, they dwelt in temporary shelters. Like every person in the nation of Israel for an entire week kind of has their own little mini Eden spot where they celebrate God's goodness together. And through these seven festivals, the nation is continually reminded with their time that they are Yahweh's people. They are special. And one of the ways that they remember is by working and by resting and by being generous to those who are around them. Then we get to chapter 24. And chapter 24 is just odd. I actually went on to chat GPT and I said, write me a sermon for Leviticus 23 through 27 just to see if it could. And uh, it wasn't bad, but it skipped 24. It's like, we'll do 25, 23, 25, and the rest of it. 24, have no idea. So even AI doesn't know what to do with sacred scripture, but that's okay, uh, because God's people do. Chapter 24 is an oddity because it begins with the regulation of the lamps, the regulation of the showbread, and then the story of the punishment of the blasphemer and a guy getting killed for cursing the name of, of Yahweh. And we're like, what? what is this about? My best explanation for what this is doing embedded within the calendar system of the nation of Israel is that this is a picture of what will happen if the people of Israel respect and revere God, listen to his commands, and obey him, and what happens if they choose not to. So later when we get to chapter 26 and the blesses and curses of, of keeping the covenant, I think that is a, a far more detailed um, explanation of what is pictured in chapter 24. So first of all, you have the lamps. In this sacred tent that the people of Israel built because God's presence came to live among them, there's this lamp called the menorah. It has seven lights on it. And there's regulation that every evening the priests are to tend the lamps so that there's always light in this tent. So thousands of years before electricity is invented, you had indoor light inside this tabernacle all the time. Shining on this golden table with these huge stacks of bread on them. Twelve loaves of bread, symbolizing the twelve tribes of Israel, and this bread is changed out every Sabbath day. And again, it's just a regulation, but I believe that the picture that is being painted for us is that as Israel gathers together with Yahweh, Sabbath by Sabbath, every seventh day, basking in the light of his presence, they will be renewed and restored that this is the life of Israel re being refreshed by the blessing that comes of living in the presence of Yahweh. So that's a positive picture. And now for the negative picture. Verse 10, Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel. And the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. And so they brought him to Moses and they put him in custody until the will of Yahweh should be clear to them. So you have this guy who's not even a, a true Israelite. He's, what is he? He's like half Egyptian, half Israelite. He's not one of the people. But in the camp, a fight happens and he, it says he, he blasphemes the name and cursed, whatever that means. And yet the punishment that comes upon him is that he is actually put to death. And as hard as that is for us, and admittedly, it's hard 
I mean, we go to we hear about blasphemers laws in the ancient, in the current Middle East in certain Muslim countries, and we're like, I'm not sure this is a good idea. The picture that is painted is that the name of God is so valuable that this guy is getting something, this guy is getting what is just for him. Um, sorry, let me phrase this a different way. Beginning in verse 13 and going through verse 23, there is this structure in the narrative. It begins with Yahweh speaking to Moses. It ends with, as Yahweh commanded Moses. It then goes to bring out of the camp the one who cursed and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, let all the congregation stone him. And then it ends with, they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and they stoned him with stones. And you basically, it tracks down and the very center of this is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And then it goes back the way it came. And so you can just plot this. The, the overall idea um, because you have this rule about what is just and that the punishment has to fit the crime. And it's embedded here in a story about someone who curses the name of God, and it makes us ponder how valuable actually is the name of God. And if you treat Yahweh as just a common being, as, as someone that you can treat as nothing and, and just say, like, f- forget it, it's like you have, you have desecrated something so precious that your life is now forfeit. It's almost like you killed a a human being. God is so valuable. Um, And the picture is like, if God is a source of life and blessing and joy, and this half-Israelite has gone through the sea, he is fed every day with manna that comes from heaven, he is drinking water that came out of a rock in the middle of the wilderness, uh, his very existence right now is from this God that he just treated as nothing. Well, if you're going to cut yourself off from the source of life, then you will be cut off from the source of life and you will be killed. And so we have these two pictures, one of of the lampstand and the showbread showing what Israel could be if they revere the name of God, and the other showing exile and death as a consequence of cutting yourself off from the God who loves you and is providing for you. There's more to be said. I welcome conversation, but I think that's what's going on in chapter 24. When you get to 25, we're back to the calendar again, and where we had cycles of seven within a week and within a year, now the calendar continues in cycles of seven years. If you're an ancient Israelite, this is what God wants you to do. Every seven years, you take a break for an entire year. You don't sow um, your fields. You don't reap your harvest. You trust that in the sixth year, God is going to give you so much that you can take a whole year off from doing the work of, of harvesting. You can take a whole year off and everything that just grows of itself will provide food for you and for the stranger and the foreigner and the wild animals. And then every seven times seven years, every 49 years, you take an extra special year called the year of Jubilee. And on the year of Jubilee, not only do you not work your fields, but everyone goes home to their ancestral lands. The land reverts. There's an economic reset every 50 years where you get to go home so if, grandfather, if your grandfather got poor and sold the family farm, 50 years later, the family gets it back. If you are a slave, you get to go free. If you are in debt, your debts are released. Every 50 years, everything resets. Why? Because God owns the land. Because God owns the people. Because time belongs to Yahweh. And if the nation of Israel is to show the rest of the world who God is and what he's like, then they need to trust him that God will provide when they don't work that they can be generous because God will provide for them, that they don't own the land, they are guests uh, uh, and people who enjoy Yahweh's hospitality all the time. And so they can show hospitality to the strangers and the foreigners among them. And so chapters 23, 24, and 25 are all really about the Sabbath. And then then we get to chapter 26 of the book of Leviticus. And it is perhaps one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible because it It gives you the template for what you're going to read in the entire Old Testament. If you walk in my statutes, in verse 3, it says, and observe my commandments and do them, I will give you your rains in their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, the grape harvest shall last to the time of the sowing, you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, no one will make you afraid. I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. 
and ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you will chase a hundred, a hundred of you will chase ten thousand. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword, and I will turn to you. And I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and will confirm my covenant with you. Genesis 1 blessings right there. You shall eat old store long kept, and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. And I will make my dwelling among you. My soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. That, that verb, I will walk among you, it's very rare, but it's used in the Garden of Eden of God walking with Adam and Eve. It's used of Enoch and Noah and Abram. These are men who walked with God. This is a picture of Eden, uh, of what life is supposed to be like, enjoying the hospitality and the presence of God. If you listen to me and you keep my commands, you will thrive and you will flourish. But if you will not listen, and now things go south. If you will not listen, then God says, I will punish you. It begins with uh, you running uh, from your enemies and you being conquered. And if you continue to walk contrary to me, then I'm going to bring famine and drought into your land. You, you should come back to me. But if you don't and you continue to go in this direction, then I'm going to send wild beasts into the land. You should come back to me. But if you don't, I will punish you again sevenfold for your sins. And your land will be under siege, and you will experience scarcity like you haven't experienced before. You should come back to me. But, but if you continue not to, then I will again punish you sevenfold for your sins. And I will bring absolute ruin and desolation and exile into you until you are scattered from the land. And it's graphic, and it's horrible, and, it, and it's cringeworthy, and I wish, I wish that what we read in Leviticus 26 was, like, rhetorical. But the fact is, as we continue reading through the Bible, everything that God says will happen if they abandon the source of life actually happens. The people of Israel will end up in exile far from God. Things will have gotten so tight that they are in their cities under siege. They are eating the bodies of their own dead because they have no more food. They are scattered to the four winds of heaven, to the nations of the world, and the land that belongs to God will finally get the rest that it needs. But the promise, the hope held out in Leviticus 26 is that God says, for those who've experienced this cataclysmic flood of judgment, for the remnant that's out there, God will remember them, just like he remembered Noah on the ark. And one day he'll bring them home not because the nation of Israel is any good, but because of who he is as a covenant-keeping God. And these are the statutes and the rules and the laws Yahweh made between himself and the people of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. I think chapter 27 of Leviticus is an appendix, so we don't end on such a downer note. Um, ten commandments about vows, and it ends up with, with ties and about the fact that God is really serious about what is being given to him. And that's where the book of Leviticus concludes with a call to holy living, a call to the utter surrender of life to Yahweh, to living fully underneath the, what it means to have him as our God. That if we follow him, everything in our life changes. Our calendar changes. Our finances change. Our sexuality changes. Everything, um, or as, as Leviticus says, we are to be holy because Yahweh is holy. We are special and we belong to him. And so I think the, the main point of Leviticus 23 through 27 is that Israel will be renewed in God's presence as they meet with him Sabbath by Sabbath, every seven days. And if they refuse, they will experience exile and death. Now for us, we thankfully don't have to keep all of these regulations and rules. For one, it, it's impossible. Like we don't live in the wilderness and there's not a tabernacle that we can go make offerings to. Um, and yet this has profound wisdom for us. Leviticus tells us that there is a God that made heaven and earth that actually desires to meet with people. He wants to live with us and he wants to bless us. Leviticus shows us wisdom that we as humans are not cogs in a machine meant to work all the time. That the constant hustle culture of the American economy is not actually good for us. That rather, we can take a break. We can go on vacation. That God has promised that he will take care of our needs enough that not only can we rest, but we can let others rest too. 
We can give our animals a break. We can give our employees a break. We don't need to be on all the time because there's a God in heaven who loves us and has promised to take care of us. If he is our life and our source of strength, then we have enough to be generous. So we don't have to work our land for all it's worth. We don't have to milk the maximum amount of blessing out of life that we can muster. Instead, we can let go and trust that God is going to look after us and bless us. And so the reality is God wants to meet with us. He has met with us in Jesus Christ. And if you are a Jesus follower, it's even better than that because God's Holy Spirit has actually taken up residence inside our hearts. And as we gather together as Christians on Sundays, week by week, to sit underneath the Word of God, we will gradually be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. Just as ancient Israel was called to reflect more and more of God's goodness and be renewed, so Jesus-following Christians, as we sit underneath the Word of God week by week, are being gradually made more and more like Christ. At least that's the hope and why I'm even here in the first place preaching. So this morning, guys, I want to call you to a couple things. I want to call you, one, to honor the name of God. It's really simple. If, If Jesus is the source of life, goodness, and blessing, then he's the source of life and goodness and blessing. Don't treat him as something cheap. Don't treat him as something optional. Don't treat him as as someone that we can just, you know, add to our life. Or we can we can treat lightly like he doesn't matter. I, I realized a while ago that it's it's an interesting thing about the culture that we live in, but I have never heard someone smash their thumb with the hammer and yell, Buddha. And I certainly haven't heard anyone say Allah in that name. Go to the Middle East. You try that. See how it goes for you. And so something I, I started realizing, like, if Jesus really is precious to me, you know, if I wouldn't let someone, you know, insult my wife in my presence without responding to it, maybe I can ask someone, like, hey, you know, you, you, can, have, you can use the other words in the English alphabet. Uh, we have lots of them for expressing distaste and anger and frustration, but but would you mind not using Jesus' name to do that? Because he matters to me. He's my life. He saved me. Would I be careful knowing that I represent Jesus? If people know that I'm a Christian, then they're going to watch me. How do I drive with a Jesus bumper sticker on my car? I'll be honest, I don't put a Jesus bumper sticker on my car because I don't want them to reflect Jesus with the way that I drive. (laughs) But if you represent him, how do we honor his name and treat it as something special, sacred, and holy? How do we do justice as God's people? Because if, if God says, you are to the ancient Israelites, he says, you will be guests on my land. You were strangers and foreigners in Egypt, so love the stranger and the foreigner as yourself. Make room, don't, you know, don't reap all the edges of your field, leave some so that the poor and the needy uh, among you may have something to eat. Like Israel had an ancient social support structure. How does that reflect my ideas of how much of my income I should be living on and how much of my income I have to take care of the needs of the people around me? How does that influence um, which particular social um, or or governmental policies that I'm going to support? And it's hard for us as Americans because, um, you know, within Leviticus, just to pick two things, we have strong sexual ethics and then a care and concern for the poor. And in America, all of a sudden we realize (laughs) those don't mesh in our two-party political system right now. So God bless, uh, God's grace be with you as you try to navigate that. Um, But God cares about the poor. He cares about the needy. And he has promised to give us enough that we can take a break. But the last thing I want to call you guys to is to love God with your time. Because as people tell you with your kids, if you want to know what love, how to spell love, you spell it T-I-M-E. That there is no quality time without quantity time. That if God matters, then it has to show up in our calendar. And so one, I want to say thank you just for gathering here today. Because meeting with God matters. Taking space for God matters. Resting matters. I had a professor who was a pastor in the deep south when they were repealing the Sunday blue laws. 
I think that's what they were called, like all the stores being closed on Sunday. And he says he and the other clergy down there were fighting against um, removing those lots. He says the moment that you can go to the grocery store on Sunday morning, the person who's going to be packing your groceries are the poor black people who are part of my church. And of course, that's exactly what happened. As the moment those laws went out, then the least desirable work schedules went to the poorest people. And now they can't worship on Sunday mornings because they have to go to work. It's one of the challenges we face here in our culture. All of you are on different work schedules. All the time, some of you are on rotational schedules. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily bad, but we have, we, we have a challenge in our culture. How do we meet with God among his people? But meeting with him matters. Taking time to say, God, you are valuable enough that I'm going to give you my time. Even if I show up and I'm grumpy and I'm tired and I yelled at my kids this morning on the way in to say, God matters enough that we want to come and experience his presence. And that there's something about gathering together with God's people for worship that just changes us. That God wants to meet with us and renew us and invite us to rest and experience refreshment in his presence. I laughed as Eric put on that Matthew 11 uh, verse. I didn't tell him about that. We just both made the same connection. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. I mean, he's just getting this idea from Leviticus. God actually says, you know, you are not to treat your slaves harshly or severely. Don't be like Pharaoh. and Don't be like Egypt. Be like me, full of love and justice and treatment for the poor. And Leviticus, again, is the solution of how how a holy God graciously makes a way for sinful, broken people to come and meet with him. And it concludes with this call, this appeal to listen and to experience life, goodness, and blessing in God's presence. Because if God's the source of life, (laughs) then connecting with him is a really good thing. And Choosing to abandon him will only lead you into exile and death. And even then, God is faithful. He will not forget his people, and he will save them because of who he is. Um, Ultimately, he did that through Jesus Christ. Um, But right now, if you find yourself in a world that is not as it should be, if you're not in the promised land right now, but you feel like, yeah, we're kind of in the wilderness, we're in exile. If there is a future and a hope that you're waiting for, I want to invite you to experience God's grace in the wilderness, to trust him enough to take a break sometimes, to go on vacation, to trust that he will give you the resources needed to pay the bills. Um, obviously, you know, work hard six days a week, but if you don't practice a weekly Sabbath, I just could not encourage you enough. It's not about taking Saturday off, It's about making time to rest and to just stop working in order to enjoy what God has made and to enjoy his presence. So that's my appeal to you. I invite uh, further conversations on this. But God loves you. He wants to meet with you. And he has met with us in Jesus Christ. So we're going to praise him uh, this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are gracious and you are good. And I, I thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus God, thank you for being the God that has brought life out of death, um, hope out of heartache. God, thank you that we don't have to earn our own way. We don't have to earn our own keep, that we are more than just a a cog in the machine. Um, But we are people who are created in your image. And so, Father, help us to love you and to trust you, that resting and being refreshed in your presence is something that's good for us that taking time out of our our week and our calendar to meet with you and with your people, to spend time in your word, to spend time in prayer, that that actually matters, that you will give us enough so that we can be generous to those who don't have enough, and that you have invited us um, to know that we we are people who depend on your hospitality, and so we can be hospitable to those that you bring into our lives. Father, we want to reflect you, and we want to be near you, we want to have life and goodness and, and a good life. We just ask that you would provide it, and that you'd help us to trust that, that the good life comes in, in following in the ways of Jesus and being close to him. So, Father, empower your people uh, today to praise the name of your Son. O Spirit, empower us to, to love our God more with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with our time. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen.